I think we're ready to start. Please take your seats and we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ted Pacone. I'm a senior fellow with the Latin America Initiative here at the Brookings Institution. Welcome uh, to what I expect will be a very interesting day of conversations, information, analysis, debate about Cuba. Um, today, uh, our topic is called Rethinking Cuba, New Opportunities for Development. And I wonder if I should end that with an exclamation point or a question mark. I think we should know better by the end of the day. There's certainly a lot of enthusiasm about the topic and also a lot of questions about the future. Um, we have a stellar roster of experts to cover the range of issues raised by the historic announcement on December 17th by Presidents Obama and Raul Castro. In just five months since December 17th, we've seen unprecedented progress toward reestablishing relations with Cuba and ending Cold War hostilities in favor of direct engagement, dialogue, and confidence building. We've seen new regulations in just one month in January and some since then to promote greater travel, trade, remittances, and direct communications. We've seen several rounds of direct talks to restore full diplomatic relations, the removal of Cuba from the list of state sponsors of terrorism, uh, which has helped uh, the Cuban interest section here in Washington find a bank, among other things, and has moved the ball forward toward reestablishing diplomatic relations. Uh, we've also seen a historic meeting between Raul Castro and Barack Obama in Panama at the Summit of the Americas and Cuba's first ever participation in the summit just last in April. We've also seen some reactions in Congress, a flurry of legislation introduced in Congress that would on the one hand lift the travel ban, ease trade restrictions, and end the embargo, and on the other hand, legislation to reverse liberalization, to demand action plans on property claim settlement, and restrict spending on a new embassy. In Havana, I would say the pace of change is, is slower, but over the last several years, uh, we've seen a number of important changes uh, toward gradually opening the economy, allowing Cubans to open small businesses and buy and sell property, travel more easily off the island, and very happy that all of our Cuban experts have made it from Cuba to Washington this time without any problems. That's a major achievement. Uh, a year ago, I don't think I could say that. Uh, so that's one sign of the ability to have more direct uh, exchange and contact with, uh, with folks on the island. Of course, there are big challenges up ahead. Uh, labor market reform, currency unification, electoral law reform, and you'll hear of many more in the course of the day. So our purpose today is to take stock of these changes uh, examine trends in the Cuban economy in the new context of U.S.-Cuba rapprochement, uh, evaluate the challenges and the opportunities for Cuba's economy. I want to thank the Christopher Reynolds Foundation and Atlantic Philanthropies for their support for organizing this conference. We will be uh, tweeting today at the handle of uh, Cuba Growth, so please uh, check that and add your own comments uh, in that space. In, as you see, we're in a uh, full crowd today. We do have an overflow room across the hallway, so if you find yourself um, leaving and then coming back and you can't find a seat here, please uh, walk just across the hallway and there will be a screen and uh, uh, a translation available there. Uh, we will have a quick coffee break uh, after the second panel around 11 o'clock. And then a lunch break out of these doors on the side here, there'll be sandwiches and, and snacks for just half an hour from 12.30 to 1, and then we'll continue the program at 1 o'clock. Um, there will be some PowerPoints in the course of uh, the day. Um, finally, you should know that for translation, uh, station 2 is for English and station 10 is for Spanish. Uh, so help yourself to that. 
And what we're going to start with is a discussion on uh, current uh, macro trends in Cuba. Um, and we're going to first hear from Stefan Selig, uh, who is the Under Secretary of Commerce for International Trade at the Department of Commerce here in Washington. He was confirmed to his position just about one year ago uh, by the U.S. Senate. And he leads, the, in, among other things, the International Trade Administration, which helps in the development of U.S. trade policy uh, in the global economy, which is an extremely busy portfolio these days. So we're very happy to have him here. Um, previously, uh, Stefan Selig served as Executive Vice Chairman of Global Corporate and Investment Banking at Bank of America Merrill Lynch, has a long uh, experience in New York and Wall Street on mergers and acquisitions uh, and global investment, including at Bank of America Securities, uh, and so well known and well understands the dynamics of the global economy and the role of U.S. businesses in uh, supporting uh, that dynamic economy. Uh, we're very happy to have him. He's going to come speak and make some initial remarks, and then we're going to have a period of time uh, to hear from two of our commentaries. One will be Juan Triana Cordovi. Uh, Juan is a graduate professor at the Center for the Study of the Cuban Economy at the University of Havana. Uh, you have all their bios, so I'm not going to go into uh, great detail. Uh, but we've gotten to know Juan through a series of meetings and expert workshops we've done with the University of Havana. Um, he teaches uh, Cuban economy and universal economic thought at the economics department at the university and travels widely around uh, the region and the world uh, giving talks on the state of the Cuban economy and has a do doctorate of economics from the University of Havana. Uh, we'll then hear from Archibald Ritter. Arch is a distinguished research professor in the Department of Economics and the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University in Ottawa. Uh, we're very happy to have him here. Arch has been studying and examining uh, Cuba for many, many years, as well as economies in Africa, um, and comes to us with great experience, uh, both in academia and in government at, at the UN. And we'll be hearing uh, from both of them about the macro trends uh, happening in Cuba. Uh, and then we'll take some time to uh, for a Q&A with you all. Uh, and so let me get moving and we'll get the program started and ask uh, Stefan to join at the panel. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to first start off by uh, thanking Ted and Brookings for the invitation uh, and the opportunity to speak with all of you today. Um, this organization, which Ted tells me is next year, will be uh, celebrating its centennial anniversary, uh, plays an essential role in forwarding sound public policy, and that obviously includes all the work that Ted and his team uh, in the Latin America Initiative uh, do uh, in providing understanding and guidance in the U.S.-Cuba uh, relations. So um, as head of the ITA, as Ted has said, um, I am charged with advancing the trade and investment agenda of the country, and I thank you for everything that you have done, will do, and for your partnership. Um, this is actually, uh, I see some familiar faces, uh, the second set of remarks I have delivered in the past two months on Cuba. Um, the first set uh, were in uh, New York uh, back in April at the Cuba Opportunity Summit, um, which was sponsored by the Wharton School. Uh, during that address, I made the point that an essential way to understanding uh, the process of normalizing relations is to see it as a journey. Uh, and as with any journey, uh, this that means there is a path and, in fact, a destination. I stated that this path means that we are embracing the policies of free enterprise and individual empowerment and embracing the policies that yield the highest returns on the qualified educated and talented human capital that Cuba possesses. Uh, as for the end point, the destination, that would be a democratic, stable, and prosperous Cuba. Uh, since I delivered these remarks, it has occurred to me that there is another way to understand this very process, and that is by seeing it within the context of time. Uh, and in fact, when you examine the process of normalizing bilateral relations in this context, I think three separate narratives emerge. The first narrative I would like to talk about is perhaps the simplest one, 
and that is separating the policy measures that have been implemented in the recent past from the ones that have not yet been implemented but may be implemented in the future. I think this is critically important given the amended regulations that have been published by the Treasury and Commerce Departments since the President's announcement this past December. And as I noted in New York, the regulations implemented by Commerce and Treasury have already facilitated travel to Cuba for authorized purposes, raised the limits on certain remittances and generally authorized certain categories of unlimited remittances to Cuba, authorized U.S. financial institutions to open correspondent accounts at Cuba financial institutions to facilitate the processing of authorized transactions, authorized certain transactions with Cuban nationals located outside of Cuba, and authorized certain other activities related to, among other areas, telecommunications, financial services, trade in certain goods and services with Cuba's private sector, and shipping. And following the completion of the 45-day congressional notification period, the Secretary of State made the final decision completing the rescission of Cuba's designation of a state sponsor of terrorism. And as we all know, that became effective last Friday, May 29th. But it is also critically important to understand what has not yet transpired. None of these measures represent a lifting of the Cuba embargo, which remains in force and codified by existing U.S. law. And none of these measures represent an endorsement of the status quo when it comes to the state of human rights in Cuba. The second narrative uh, is separating the recent period of time focused on the reestablishment of diplomatic relations and the initial steps towards normalization from the much longer time needed to, for full normalization to unfold. I think as everyone here knows, we have seen a number of events emerge in relatively short order. In fact, on the day, day I delivered my remarks in New York, Airbnb announced that 2,000 Cuban homes would be added to their listings. And in just the last two months, we have seen JetBlue announce that they would conduct a weekly flight between New York and Cuba. The issuance of specific licenses authorizing the transportation of authorized travelers by vessel. A delegation led by my governor, Governor Cuomo, the first governor-led trade mission since the December announcement. Cuba's participation in the Summit of the Americas, uh, as well as the meetings between Presidents Obama and Castro, the removal of Cuba's designation as a state sponsor of terrorism, which I just mentioned, and the current focus on reestablishing diplomatic relations and the reopening of embassies. So, that there, so there is no denying the speed of these developments. And there is also no denying the excitement from the various communities and stakeholders that these developments reflect. But let us be clear, the small amount of time during which these events emerge should not be confused with the long period of time that will be needed to resume normalized relations. Both Cuba's path to reforming its economy and the path of normalizing bilateral relations will be evolutionary and deliberative. From the standpoint of the administration, we have, been chosen, we have chosen engagement over isolation, which we believe will allow us to work more effectively with Cuba across a variety of issues, including encouraging Cuba to embrace free market, pro-growth policies. And as the President acknowledged in December, Cuba has already made some reforms to gradually open up its economy. In fact, Richard Feinberg, in the first row, outlined a few of them in his 2012 report uh, entitled The New Cuban Economy, liberalizing private markets for small businesses, distribution of state lands, private markets for farm products, and the selling of auth automobiles and homes. And as Richard noted in his 2013 study, the number of self-employed Cuban workers has nearly tripled since 2009. That said, this process will clearly be a long one. And the leading reason is because the Cuban economy possesses deep structural challenges. And we are all well of them. A population half the size of Shanghai and defined by years of negative growth. An infrastructure system that cannot adequately handle trade, transportation, or digital commerce a very slack labor market due to state sector roles shedding nearly 600,000 jobs, and an industrial sector that produces at less than 50% of 1989 levels, according to Richard's report. And a rising dependency ratio driven by an aging population, which runs counter to much of the developing wor world, according to my fellow panelist, Juan Triana, who you will hear more from. And these last two points dovetail into the final narrative I would like to discuss today. I think it is safe to say that the Cuban economy can best be described as one that has been stuck in time. 
And maybe the most telling example of Cuba's ec economy being stuck in time is the level of its development relative to other countries in the region. So I think it is worth comparing Cuba's economic growth with that of four nations who have embraced the policies of open markets, individual empowerment, and institution building. Of course, I am referring to Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru. As of 1970, Cuba's nominal GDP was comparable with Chile, Peru, and Colombia. In fact, the nominal GDP of all four nations was within $3 billion of each other. Cuba was at the low end at roughly $5.7 billion, and Chile was at the high end at just under $9 billion. Now, let's fast forward 40 plus years. Chile, Colombia, Mexico are all top 40 economies in terms of nominal GDP. The closest economy in nominal GDP to Cuba is Peru. In 1970, Peru's nominal GDP was $7.2 billion. Today, it is $202 billion. That is almost three times the value of Cuba's nominal GDP of roughly $68 billion today. As for Mexico, in 1970, Cuba's nominal GDP was roughly 16% of the size of Mexico. Now, let's fast forward 40 plus years. Cuba's economy is now less than 6% the size of Mexico's $1.26 trillion economy. And in roughly 40 years, these four nations not only rose to comprise the Pacific Alliance, but three of them are also now our negotiating partners for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I think all of this speaks to the true value of the new course we are charting with Cuba. This course, this new course, will not mean turning back the clock. What we hope it will mean is starting the clock. But now let us all be clear. We have no illusions about the roadblocks to getting there. This will take time. But charting this new course for the U.S. government means starting the clock on a policy of engagement, which offers the best opportunity to expand the political freedoms of the Cuban population, to deepen the connection between the American and Cuban people, and to advance U.S. interests. Charting this new course for the Cuban government means starting the clock on an economy that has been stuck in time over the past several decades. If Cuba fully commits to the policies of free enterprise, that will expand the opportunities, expand the political freedoms, and improve the day-to-day -day existence of the Cuban people. Finally, as the Cuban people chart this new course, they will be starting the clock on a process, which years from now means their country will no longer be an outlier to its regional peers, their country will be able to stand right next to them. Cuba will be able to stand next to Chile, a nation that became the very first South American country to enter the OECD. Cuba will be able to stand next to Colombia, a nation that became the third largest economy in the region. Cuba will be able to stand next to Peru, a nation that will soon host the first annual IMF and World Bank meetings in Latin America in nearly 50 years. And Cuba will be able to stand next to Mexico a country that went from the brink of eco economic collapse to a member of the G20 in less than a generation. And Cuba will not only stand with these nations in the future under this new course, nations throughout the world will aspire to stand next to Cuba. It is worth noting, I think, that uh, the poem that was read during the president's 2013 inauguration was entitled One Today. And it was written by a Cuban-American poet, Richard Blanco. The poem begins with the line, one sun rose on us today. I think this is particularly fitting because it encapsulates the highest aspiration we have for successfully normalizing relations with Cuba. That aspiration is for Cuba and the Cuban people to finally experience the very same today with the United States, with its fellow partners in the Americas, and with the world as a whole. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you, Stefan, for those comments. And um, all of our materials will be posted uh, later in the day after the event, both audio and video transcripts. So um, if you miss anything, you can always consult there. Uh, we're now going to uh, hear from Juan Triana and Arch Ritter uh, give us their views on the general picture of Cuba's economy, and then we'll open up for further discussion. Juan.
Ahora sí. Since I have terrible English, I'm going to speak in Spanish. Firstly, I wanted to thank Brookings and Tag for organizing this event and inviting me to discuss once again uh, Cuban affairs. And I'm going to try to do it slowly in the seven minutes that I've been given to give my presentation. I wanted to start reminding you that the process that Cuba is experiencing at this time is way from began way before December 17th. It's important. The timeline is important. It started in 1986, 87 is when this began. When the when the Cuban economy became stagnant, and then in the 90s, when there was a deep crisis, and from 87 to 94, there was a crisis. A deep crisis that we under endured. The second period, when 1994 to 2007, and there's it could, it could be too. There was a gr economic growth period that we had with a lot of volatility, volatility, but growth of the Cuban economy, and the adoption of a of a set of policies which, which opened and or made the uh, economy more centralized. This is. There's three periods, the three different histories. This latest period, the, the most important piece of news, of course, is that on the 17th of December, of course, the equation of development may change one of its, its parameters, which is its relationship with the United States. The other thing I wanted to mention is that in the last four years, the performance of the Cuban economy over the last five years has been in, in growth product. GDP uh, performance has been quite poor. We've grown at a rate that's below 2.5%, which, is, which isn't too good. And we continue to face a lot of significant problems, problems of investment, and balance, balance of trade. And, but with some good news on the horizon when it comes to current accounts of the, of the Cuban economy. In 2014, the data on the on the economy are as good than the current accounts. And the fact that the government announced that it has revenues of $10 billion worth of in reserves, the government announced it had. Projections for 2015, in contrast with that res result, is, is quite different. There's a projected 4% growth and a 27% increase of investment over the prior year, Gro growth of, of 3.5% growth, and a new, new loans credits of in the amount of $5 billion, which could be the leverage required to allow for a 4% growth rate. The interest, what would be worthwhile to uh, point out some new issues that have emerged. Yesterday, uh, Brahma published new measures that the government agreed to take over the next few days. Uh, there's an executive, the Council of Ministers had an executive committee meeting in, to expand the, these uh, re opening and reforming of the opening of the national economy uh, with regard to the new cooperatives. Uh, there are in important groups, uh, agreements. Uh, and also, there's one cooperative. It wasn't for other sectors, just for this cooperative. So what they talked about expanding this, this particular sector. Secondly, the, uh, the the hiring of, of workers who are not members of the cooperatives for m more than three months. Before it was only up to three months. Now the regulations are allowed a year, 12 months. So there can be non-members of the cooperatives who can be hired. And with regard to release from paying uh, taxes, it was three months. Now it's going to be six months a year tax exempt, and you don't have to pay taxes over what you earn from the competitors. And this is last week, these were announced, and I think this will represent a big change. Sistema bancario cubano. The second set of measures uh, is regarding the banking system in Cuba. I think it's the first time that it's actually recognized what difficulties exist in the Cuban banking system. And so the state functions will now be separated uh, from uh, the uh, business uh, functions of the of the banks mm. there will be new instruments and services 
that will be provided to all the population, including the private sector. There's even a decision to uh, stimulate uh, lending. I'm not sure what the details will be, but there will be new uh, loans available for the country starting about a month from now, approximately. So these are some of the new measures that have been uh, decided on a week ago. So these speak to the continuity of that process. What else has been done? Well, two years ago, also new uh, regulations for investments were approved. Uh, the attempt is to transform uh, Cuban state businesses so they have greater capacity to make decisions. Now, in terms of results, uh, we don't have information about what how many new investments have been approved in Cuba in general, not just in development. What is true is that there are proposals by over 300 businesses in Mariel and outside of Mariel as well. Uh, and not long ago in Mariel, uh, the first uh, six uh, businesses had been approved from different countries. They can now begin to operate there. And what's interesting is that uh, thanks to mm -hmm. December 17th, there has been a uh, tremendous growth in tourism now. Uh, there's been in the last four months a 14% growth. And in, in terms of Americans visiting the island, this has gone up over 20%. So this is a significant uh, figure. It reflects a new perception. Okay, good. Okay. And here I have for you uh, the results of a survey by a Florida based company on uh, the uh, business environment in Cuba for foreigners who have businesses and who work in Cuba. I uh, don't have the previous one, unfortunately. I, I don't know where I put it in this machine, so I can't do the comparison. But I think it's interesting to see, especially the response by those business people to this survey. I have four of those responses. The first one is related to how they see the future for the investments of their businesses in Cuba in the next four months. And the response is very positive there, overwhelmingly positive. I, even I, was surprised by it. The second one is also very positive if we take into account that only 10% feels that their uh, businesses could uh, suffer in the country, could uh, decline in the near future in the country. I'll go, I'll just get out. The second one is also very positive. And the third one related to uh, expectations for the next three months, very short term, also mostly positive for these uh, business people for these first three months of the year. And the last one, the most sensitive of all, I think, where Cuba has had serious problems in the last few years and so have foreign businesses, the response is also positive. The financial situation of the country and how it is perceived by these businesses in Cuba. So definitely this tells us that there's a change in perceptions regarding the country and its economy. And a significant part of that change, of course, is associated to the news we got on December 17th. And finally, that last company has a uh, projection for growth uh, for Cuba, which is also very positive, three point, between 3.4 for two, 2015 and 5.3% for the year 2017. And I think that's good. I think we're looking at an important transformation of Cuba's image in the eyes of business people and of the rest of the world. The last 
It's not the last, actually. But the one more point that I wanted to discuss is related to the pace of transportation. This has been discussed. And I will quote Raul Castro, something he said yesterday that was quoted in the newspaper Grama when we, he was talking about the reform process in Cuba. And I will do it as slowly as possible so the interpreters can uh, translate it. He said, human beings are the ones who put forth the proposals, also those who approve it, also those who lead the country. We don't always have experience in these tasks. That therefore, everything we do needs to be subject always to critical or constructive criticism, rather. So I think there's something that is slowing down transformation in Cuba, and it is related to the lack of expertise. And secondly, we have some rather blurry lines, uh, and this has not been resolved from a an academic perspective or from a political perspective. And some of these boundaries, some of these lines really have a lot of weight. For example, what is uh, of the state and what isn't? What is uh, proper management, the relationship between planning and the market, the experience of a government that's very focused on um, on uh, income uh, rather than efficiency? And there's also equality, that's another Another issue, another area that needs to be defined in our country. And uh, finally, I know I'm almost out of time. I wanted to talk about after 2015, because usually we talk about the present and the past. What Cuba is facing this year is a serious process. And many different processes are taking place at the same time. Next year, there will be a new Congress for the Communist Party. There will be uh, significant modifications of the country's constitution. And during the first phase of it, a long-term development program will be discussed. There will be a new generation of political leaders leading the country. And this is what we all hope, that this process, uh, this uh, reconstruction, this rebuilding of the U.S.-Cuba relationship will continue also the process of improving relations between Cuba and the European Union. Uh, an agreement needs to be negotiated with the Paris Club, and there will be a more open economy with greater participation by the market from foreign direct investment and new economic agents. We'll need to think about the role of the new uh, Cuban diaspora, which is different from the previous one in everything, including their plans for their lives. And Cuba will become a new society, will need to have new characteristics. So in this process and this, and this aspiration of becoming a prosperous country where at some point perhaps we can approach countries such as Colombia or Mexico or Chile, we still don't want to lose what the revolution has helped our, countries, our country gain. These other countries have not reached us in terms of the development expressed as the well-being of much of their population. And it's true that we are not having an IMF meeting this year. That's good. But we had a fundamental involvement in the fight against Ebola in Africa. This is something none of those countries did. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. I think that was a great way to start with a comprehensive look at the various factors, including a look ahead, which is really important. Um, Arch, please give us your, your reflections. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a great uh, pleasure and privilege to be here at Brookings. I thank you for the opportunity, Ted. It's wonderful to be in Washington for a Good News, Good Times conference on Cuba. Uh, in fact, when I was trying to sum up my message in the form of a title, the title that came up was, was the Cuban economy good times ahead? 
And that is something because uh, us uh, people who have focused on the Cuban economy for some years have focused on problems. But uh, looking forward, things look uh, a, a whole lot better in Cuba now. Well, what I would like to do in this presentation is to uh, talk about macroeconomic prospects in the short, medium, and long term, but focusing on the medium and, lo and long term. And then I'd like to make a couple of comments on prospective institutional structures for the Cuban economy in the long term. Well, first, the short term. Uh, I define the short term as being one in which the uh, U.S. policy does not go that much further and in which reforms within Cuba uh, uh, move slightly but not in a dramatic way. So it's, it's close to the status quo with gradual changes. I think, as, as uh, Juan uh, indicated in his chart, uh, the benefits of that are uh, being predicted for the next few years. I think the, the, uh, the impacts of American tourism in Cuba, of remittances and so on, are going to be positive, modest at first, but building, building to a tsunami in the, in the future. Oops, too loud? Oh, sorry. Um, so in the short term, uh, I think the results look good, M maybe not ultra dramatic, but strong. In the medium term, I would define that as being full normalization, but without dramatic major changes in, in uh, economic policy within Cuba. Uh, I would guess that that might start in maybe the last years or may of uh, Raul's presidency or maybe after uh, his presidency. And then I think with no full normalization, we're going to see major amounts of investment in Cuba uh, from Cuban, the Cuban American community, uh, from the United States and from other countries who want to invest in Cuba to, to uh, get access to the US market. So I think we're going to see major increases in, in foreign investment. Um, I think we're going to see big increases in exports, uh, big technological transfer. We're going to see major synergies between the Cuban American community uh, in the United States, especially Miami, uh, and and uh, Cuba, and those should bear uh, uh, very very good fruit. One question mark in my mind, one ambiguous element in all of this is Mariel, the export processing zone, uh, constructed eight eight hundred and fifty million dollars by Brazil. That'll have to be repaid at some point. That is proceeding slowly. Um, and there are th the difficulty, well, there are a couple of problems with that. One is that it may be very successful in a sense because China and other countries may invest there in future to get access to the U.S. market, paying no taxes for 10 years and then only a 12% tax there thereafter and other benefits. Uh, but the problem for Cuba is uh, limited value added, limited taxation. The problem for the United States may be, may be uh, uh, special access to uh, its market uh, with uh, sort of high implicit subsidization. So that's a question mark. In the longer term, uh, I would define that as full normalization plus major reforms, major reforms being monetary and exchange rate, uh, unification, convertibility, further liberalization for small and medium enterprise, uh, and so on. My prediction would be uh, that at that point, there, there sh should be major expansion, major improvement in the Cuban economy. And I would draw on Alexander Gershenkron. Some of the, some of the old timers here <laughs> might remember that name. But he wrote a book back in the 60s entitled The Advantages of Being a Latecomer. Uh, when one is uh, uh, moving into modern technologies late, you adopt the latest technology, the best technology. That gives you an advantage. Well, Cuba has uh, uh, a huge international backlog of technology which can it can incorporate in services, agriculture, construction, everything. So that should increase productivity in all sectors of the economy. That should be very positive. So uh, my thinking is that in time, uh, uh, Cuba should do very well. A, uh, a comment I'd like to make, if I have time here, <laughs> on future institutional structures. Cuba could have many possible uh, institutional economic futures. Um, right now, it has a mixed economy, uh, state sector, joint ventures, cooperative sector, private sector. Uh, we're going to see the state sector shrink. 
Uh, we're going to see that uh, the cooperative sector expand, small enterprise sector expand, um, and maybe joint ventures, uh, which are state or foreign uh, combinations, become more important. Well, uh, this uh, raises a, a major issue for me. Uh, and just as background, on the one hand, Cuba has a significant and large population of independent entrepreneurs. In fact, Fidel said back in, in the 70s or 60s that he, he wanted Cuba to be a giant school for socialism. As it has worked out, Cuba has been a giant school for entrepreneurship for, for various reasons that I won't go into. So with the various liberalization uh, moves that have been made, we've seen entrepreneurship burst uh, above ground and, and flourish. On the other hand, Cuba has a large conglomerate, oligopolistic, monopolistic state enterprises, many of them military owned, many of them involved with some sort of crony state capitalist uh, uh, phenomena. So my concern in future, it would the, the easiest thing for some future Cuban government would be to privatize the state enterprises by simply selling them uh, these conglomerates to, to big foreign buyers, Walmarts, Lowe's, uh, uh, McDonald's, Hilton, whatever. That would be the easiest thing of earn revenues uh, that would improve technologies pretty quickly. The long-term cost would be profits being expatriated forever. There would be distributional uh, implications of that concentration of income in, in terms of the, uh, the owners and loss of Cuban character, I would say. Well, the decision then is whether to permit sort of a Walmartization of the Cuban economy uh, in, in 10 years or so, or to uh, cooperativize it, that's another option, or to boost small Cuban enterprise. Well, uh, this is, go uh, in order to prevent some sort of Walmartization, this is going to require a strong foreign investment policy to, to uh, define the character of, of a foreign investment and foreign takeovers. So that's, that's a tricky thing. Speaking personally, and this is my last comment, I really like Toronto, I really like Miami, I really like Cleveland, well, sort of, <laughs> uh, but uh, I would not like uh, Havana to become a copy of uh, even Toronto, or definitely not Toronto. Um, so I would like Cuba to maintain its uniqueness, and that is going to require some control on foreign investment and the evolution of the pri private sector. Uh, well, the same thing goes for Cuba. So uh, I would like Cuba to keep its Cuban character. So many thanks. Thank you, Arch. Uh, I think we've got a great way uh, to look at the various uh, issues on the agenda. We've got maybe 20 minutes or so to have a dialogue. Let me pose a question that I think was sparked in part by uh, Arch's uh, uh, typology of you know uh, full normalization plus major reforms that idea uh, which is quite hopeful um, will involve getting there from here a tremendous number of, of zigzags and steps forward and steps backwards and I'm wondering if the three panelists could comment a little bit on that interim period between now and then I'm thinking in particular of the dynamic of the embargo um, we'd still face a very uh, comprehensive U.S. embargo that will require Congress to take action. And the question for us in the United States, of course, is to uh, have a really lively debate with as much information as possible on the table about the pros and cons of the embargo. And I'm just wondering if you could play out for us a little bit how you see um, the debate around the embargo affecting the pace of change in Cuba. Will it be more likely that the Cuban government will want to wait and hold back on a process of reform until it actually sees that the U.S. is prepared to lift the embargo? Or will it choose to go ahead with a process of major reforms regardless of the pace of change on the embargo because it sees ultimately the day when the U.S. market will open up at great advantage to the Cuban economy? Could you guys comment on that briefly? All three of you, please. Well, I'll leave it to my colleagues to comment on um, uh, 
what the reaction is likely to be in Cuba, but um, obviously legislative action is, is required to lift the embargo. Um, uh, and I think uh, the President um, uh, has taken many of the uh, steps towards normalizing relations, um, but in fact Congress must pass legislation to do that. And so um, uh, I'm not good at the parlor game of guessing what the timeline um, uh, and process might be to get there, um, other than to say that um, I think it's been clear by this administration that um, we are encouraging the Congress to do um, just that. But I think, Ted, to your point, um, I think we do have to be careful about maintaining an appropriate pace in this process such that we don't um, lose enthusiasm uh, down the road, um, which is to say I think there's been a lot of excitement here uh, in the United States, a lot of excitement, I understand, in Cuba. I think that's, that's reflective of the sold-out, uh, overflowing crowd you have today. And what I would hope wouldn't happen uh, is that would um, – uh, begin to wane if the embargo is not lifted in the near term, which I think really um, causes all of us to have to be, you know, vigilant and continue to kind of work within the constraints that we have to work within um, to talk about the benefits of uh, the end point um, uh, in, this, in, in this journey. Well, uh, as Paul Marcani said, it is a long and winding road. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> And um, in my personal opinion, uh, really is a long, long, long and winding road. Because embargo is more than one law, it's a really net of law. And it's too difficult uh, to lift embargo in maybe in one year or in two years. I don't see the, the end of the embargo in, in, in the next uh, one year and a half. But uh, in terms of the, of the process in Cuba, uh, on the pace of the process in Cuba, I, I, I want to remark that, uh, that the environment and, and context is everything in business. And of course, if Cuba can, uh, can have a, a, um, a, a better context in order to, to make business, well, it's, uh, it's good. And maybe, maybe the, the pace of the, of the transformation uh, could be a different dy uh, dynamic. In, in, in the context. For instance, w when I showed the slide, uh, the, the business environment the, the, uh, uh, and the business perception uh, for the foreign companies uh, today is, is quite different. And many, many different uh, groups of, of businessmen is, is, is going to Cuba every week in order to smell, to see what is happening in Cuba. And uh, it's the first time that the end of the tunnel is really close. It's the first time. So uh, in my personal opinion, it uh, could be positive if, 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 the, if the pace of the, of the lifting of the embargo uh, go ahead in the next one. Yeah, a very quick response. Whoops. Um, uh, I agree with, with what has been said. I think uh, if the embargo were to, to end quickly, uh, which is unlikely, I think that would, would encourage a much more rapid process of reform in Cuba. But uh, with, with uh, uh, just uh, such a slow unwinding, as you put it, of the, of the embargo, uh, I can't see that the reform pace is going to accelerate that much. Raul Castro... Uh, has shown himself to be a very careful, very cautious uh, reformist. Uh, unlike his brother, uh, who would make massive changes uh, very, very quickly, Raul seems to be very pragmatic and very cautious in his, his uh, actions. So I, uh, he has a couple of more years in, in his uh, uh, era. Uh, I think that he will want to consolidate and tweak uh, the reforms that are in operation, but per, and he would like to solve the monetary issue, but that also is a, a difficult one to, to uh, disentangle. So um, uh, I think that the, the, the process of, of reform is going to wait until the embargo happens, which is going to wait until something happens in Congress. And of course, 
some people say, well, Congress isn't going to start moving on this until more change happens in Cuba. So there is a real dynamic that gets complicated very quickly on this. And ultimately, uh, both sides need to make their own decision based on their own interests on how and, and the timing of going forward. Um, why don't we open it up to any uh, questions that you may have. There should be a microphone coming forward. If you could identify yourself and try to keep your comment relatively brief. And I see, yes, Ricardo, please. Ricardo Torres. I am Ricardo Torres. Anna, so just a quick comment. So now that you mentioned that it's a obvious dynamic, right? Things happening in Cuba, things that could happen in the U.S. Congress, U.S. in general. So I think we, we have to take into account also um, that interests might be very different from each side. And my point is that there is a huge asymmetry between Cuba and the United States in terms of economic dimension, political power, and all that. So, I mean, restoring full economic ties with uh, Cuba is not a big deal for the United States. So the power of this is, is symbolic. Uh, it's, it's very symbolic. So it's very important from that point of view. For Cuba, restoring full economic ties with the United States, it's a huge deal. It could change everything forever in every possible dimension. So I think it's understandable that the Cuban side would like to proceed carefully not to derail, not to do anything that could derail the, this, uh, the whole process. Um, so again, let's bear in mind that asymmetry when we analyze you know, the dynamic of this process. And by the way, as, I mean, we all know that, but Cuba is not imposing sanctions on the United States. It's the other way around. So and obviously, Cuba is suffering from the fact that it's a very small country. So, I mean, the list of priorities, I mean, for the U.S. in terms of strategic issues, it's not important. So, if Cuba were Saudi Arabia or something like that, so it would have been very different. So, I think it's important to understand that it's a small country and it's a big deal for Cuba, this whole process. So, I mean, it's understandable, in my, my opinion, that this is proceeding the way uh, it is. Thank you. Can I, can I just make um, one sure. comment? Because, um, of course, I think we concur that from an economic perspective, we are starting at wildly different places, and there are wildly different implications for our respective countries. But um, I would like to say that I also believe that we do have a commonality of interests, and that is we both hope that these changes that have already been made and that will be made um, uh, will uh, empower the Cuban people and will fundamentally move Cuba towards greater openness and prosperity. And that is something that the United States wants. I believe that is something that the Cuban government wants. And hopefully that end point will help us um, meander through this long and winding road together effectively. Other questions? Please. Can we get a microphone? <coughs> As a layperson, can you, can you identify yourself, please? James Gomez from New York. As a layperson, not a Cuba expert, what more can be done uh, on an executive uh, action basis by the president without congressional um, action uh, to further open up? relations um, or normalize relations between the two countries? Um, sure. Well, uh, I'm not sure that I could be precise in terms of additional executive actions. Um, uh, what I can say is that um, uh, what we are doing and what the entire administration is doing is, is I think, talking about the benefits of, of of uh, where we hope this process um, will take us. So I think there is 
There is, in fact, complete consensus within the administration that the old policy was failing and that this is a policy that we should um, continue to march down the road towards. Um, it is more than just the embargo, however. Um, there are also our restrictions, for example, in the Commerce Department about what we can't do. So um, as uh, Ted said, I'm responsible for um, a trade and investment for the United States in advancing our export interests. Um, because of other uh, uh, re regulations, we, for example, are not allowed to provide export assistance to um, U.S. companies uh, at the moment uh, outside of those that narrow band of industries that um, were previously allowed by license. So um, I think there are other things, and as I think Juan said, this is not just one law. This is a network and web of laws. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to continue to chip away at them. Well, let me comment on, the, on this question, which is a very important question, because I think it's an ongoing debate about how much authority the president has to go further. Um, the general sense has been, especially the, over the last several years, that the, the uh, power of the president was obvious uh, in the things that he could do, exceptions to the embargo, to move forward. The announcement of December 17th and the announcement since then, um, the president has used most of that authority, in my view, uh, to uh, do what he's done. And now, I think, the, the burden falls on, number one, those in actors on the U.S. side to take advantage of the changes that the president has made. It's not just travel and remittances. I mean, we can now extend further economic and trade opportunities Maybe not with the help of the Commerce Department, but through private initiative. And the Airbnb is a perfect example of, of uh, how a U.S. company can do something, get involved in the Cuban market that also very much fits uh, the overall policy approach Stefan mentioned of empowering the Cuban people and allowing them to develop their own economic activities. And I think a lot more can be done, including in the charitable humanitarian space, people to people and humanitarian types of academic exchanges. There's so much more that can be done. Uh, and we should really fill in the cement of this brick house that we're trying to build as, as quickly as possible and take advantage of those changes. Um, what more the president can do is really, I think, not much more in my view. I think it really falls to Congress to have its own debate and discussion uh, in the meantime for other actors to fill in the gap. Uh, we have lots of hands now, so let me <laughs> take let me take three at a time. Uh, here, Rolando, and then here, and then the middle. Uh, uh, Rolando, and you, I'm an attorney. Um, um, going back to the question about what else could be done, specifically on the export regulation, uh, by removing Cuba from the list of the terrorist countries, uh, there would be certain impact on uh, export regulations. Uh, do you anticipate any uh, publishing uh, in the Federal Register of those changes soon, and specifically uh, the impact on export of the U.S. component uh, for export from third countries? I believe there would be a change on that percentage and uh, in certain products. Thank you. Okay, and then right here. Hi, Linda Delgado with uh, Oxfam. Um, I'm just wondering how much information do you have about what the Cuban people want and what the Cuban government wants with respect to development and the Walmartization that was being discussed earlier? Do they want to move very quickly? Do they want to go slowly and protect the good and the special? What is the sense there? Okay, and one more in the middle. Yes, this gentleman with his hand up. Hi, Jose Gabilondo, Universidad Internacional de la Florida. University of Florida, wonderful uh, presentations. I think what you're all talking about, it is official action, actions of the state. But to what extent do they, are these uh, processes unleashing dynamic energy, things like the visible hand that will have their own life, and they can go hand in hand, and they can it lead to unforeseen r effects. One, do you want to take the? Okay. Uh, I want to begin, uh, to begin with the last question, because I think it's a very, very, uh, very interesting question. Uh, in me, in me from my personal point of view, what's happening today in Cuba is truly that there has been unleashed, uh, processes have been 
set in motion that one way or another are fall outside of the official channel. So, for example, what's happening in the private sector today, it's a mess. Than 2,800 new restaurants in, 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 in the country. And this restaurant means demand for the other, uh, for, for, for the other business. And uh, it is saying, like, uh, if you see in, in, in the case of the, of the tourist sector, today the, the private sector have more than 18,000 18, rooms in rent. It's the second largest business tourist in Cuba today. And it means demand for other, for, for other business. Um, pasa lo mismo con, con, con otras cosas. Eh. The same thing is going on with other things at this time in Cuba. And in other words, the same relationship or that exists between Cuba and the Cubans who live in Cuba and Cubans who live outside, There's a, the relationship has changed significantly. The, the, the diaspora, the new Cuban di diaspora, uh, I am referring to the, the, the new people who is going out of Cuba on the, the new law, or on the, of the, the new migration law. And uh, it's different, totally different. Even in the case of the young people who was uh, going out of Cuba to get some um, job or to, 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 to get some uh, different career in other universities. It's, it's totally different. I think it's, 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 it is important. In the case of the other question, in regard to the other question, actually, what does the Cuban people really want? What what pace is acceptable to them? And what's the pace accepted by the government? The government is very clear. The government's going to be very cautious and, and with as slowly as, as is required. The process is really, really uh, uh, deep in the case of Cuba. And it changed not only the economy, but the society too. In the case of the, of the people, well, the, the, the first data is uh, when Cuba launched the, the Los Lineamientos Económicos y Sociales. Social and Economic Guidelines, and that original guideline was changed, changed in about 60% of it was changed. That was the first boundary. First limit of the, of the reform in Cuba. Even the, the, the people was more conservative than the economists. Yeah. Ahora es diferente. Now it's different. I believe it's different now because there's a person, it's like a snowballing effect in the economy and Cuban society, which is very typical of any uh, transformation and reform process. As soon as you start uh, with these reforms, new reforms are required and there's a snowball effect. And this is creates uh, expectations among the people. In any case, I would like to uh, explain something. Cuba is not Havana. Remember that. I want to explain something. Sometimes we view Cuba as if Cuba was Havana. Havana is very important. I'm from Havana, I'm, and I'm from the from the, in the, the industrial thing. And I mean, don't no confusion about it. I am. I am. But when you leave Havana, it's a horse of a different color. And people have to have time to get used to the new situation. Nobody goes to bed being a state official and then wakes up be, being a successful entrepreneur the next morning. So there's a period of time you, that you have to give to people. And I believe even though the government doesn't say, and this is part of the philosophy that the government is following for this transformation, these major changes, even though it may not say so. On uh, uh, what, what uh, the Cuban people want, I don't pretend to know. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I was in Cuba uh, in April for a period of time, and what, what struck me was the optimism of, of uh, everybody I met. It was a sort of a changed environment. There was a, an interesting uh, survey that I'm sure most of you saw in the Washington Post here about a month ago. Uh, any survey in Cuba has its difficulties, but, but that was about uh, maybe the, the, one of the best ones. Found that 97% were in favor of the, the normalization. They had a listing of people's personal objectives and, and the most important objectives, and I've forgotten that list. Uh, uh, but, but that gave some indication. What I do remember is the Cubans were asked, do you have a favorable opinion of Fidel, Raul, and Obama? I remember these numbers. <laughs> it was Fidel, 41%, I think. Uh, Raul, 46%, favorable opinion. Obama, 58. Yeah, 
And uh, that struck 80, me until 80 percent. Oh, 80. Than oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Well, that's that seemed very Im impressive to me, incredible. But then I thought, in Canada, we would get exactly the same result. <laughs> So maybe I can just uh, quickly do the first one, um, uh, which is how do um, companies uh, avail themselves of opportunities that currently exist before the embargo um, uh, may be lifted in the future? And so obviously it is important for um, U.S. companies to understand the categories of goods and services um, that can be currently exported to Cuba. The best way to do that, um, frankly, is to address specific questions to one of two places, the um, Bureau of Industry and Security, BIS, and the United States Department of Commerce, or the Treasury Department's um, Office of Foreign Assets um, uh, Control, uh, which is called um, OFAC. So I think those are the two places to go. Um, what I would say, again, as a former business guy, um, this is about knowing your market, knowing your customer, understanding the challenges uh, in order to be successful within the constraints that currently exist. I'm afraid that we have come uh, out of time, and we'll have lots more time to continue and get deeper into some of these issues. Um, please stay in your seats, because we're just going to have a switch of the panel, and we'll begin right away. Um, the next panel will be on issues of financing Cuba's development, which is a critical part of the puzzle. Um, but please join me in thanking the panel uh, for this introduction.